For inequality to exist, there must be some story justifying why those at the top deserve more than those at the bottom. And in ancient times, basically, it was religion. And so kings had an association with God. And because that association, you know, because of that association with God, they were allowed to have more, and, and people that were at the bottom understood, you know, that the ones at the top had an association with God, and therefore they deserve more. But certainly in, in, in recent years and recent centuries, you know, that, that has not been, you know, like the, the most preferred option, and, and we need to develop new explanations. And, and one of the explanations that has emerged, you know, is this idea that the market is meritocratic. You know, so meaning that the market allocates things in such a way that the ones that contribute more get more and the ones that contribute less get less. And that has been a prevalent idea, you know, uh, but the question is, well, is that idea contingent to maybe some overly simplified view of the world or some assumptions that are a little bit you know, uh, too blunt? So one of the things that we have been exploring is we have been exploring uh, on the creation of mathematical models that can help us understand you know, whether you know, markets are always meritocratic or not, you know, when these are structured according to networks. So I'm going to introduce a very simple idea, and what, what I'm going to ask you to consider is to consider that you have a little network in which every node is an individual, and those individuals, every time step, they produce a certain type of cultural content. So they say they're producing like a book, a movie, a song, something like that. Okay? And they sell that content to other individuals in that network. Now, I'm going to assume that each individual in that network is endowed with a parameter t, which is his or her talent. So if your parameter t is 0 0.8, you sell your content to 80% of the people. If it's 0 0.2, 20% of the people buy your content. So in some sense, the more talent that you have, the more revenue that you should expect to have, because you have more potential customers. Now, you, know, you can think that that network might be fully connected. And if the network is fully connected, what you would find is that that system is perfectly meritocratic because you know, the guys that have more talent you know, get more income, and the ones that have less talent get less income. But we can assume now also that the system is not fully connected, and that in some sense, if I want to sell some content to you, maybe I'm not going to be able to sell it directly, and I'm going to have to go through a circuitous path that is going to go through a number of people. And those people that are in between are going to get a cut. So when I assume that in the behavior that I sell content, I'm going to call that behavior a rock star behavior, and when I'm intermediating content, I'm going to call it an agent behavior. So I'm being an agent, I'm sort of arbitraging things between. You can think that in a network that is fully connected, certainly, you know, the rockstar behavior determines that everyone is meritocratic. But if we start making a network sparser and sparser, you know, eventually what's going to happen is that the guys that are in between, the guys that are agents, might be getting a larger benefit than the guys you know, that you know, are generating the content. If you think on the extreme opposite, of a fully connected network, which will be a star network in which there's one hub in the middle, you know, and every other node is in the periphery, you know, basically most of the income is going to go into that hub because the number of shortest paths that go through a node go as the square as the total number of nodes in the network. So now, what we have done in this model is we have solved everything analytically and we have explored you know, at which point a network goes from meritocratic to topocratic. A meritocratic system is in one in which the individual contribution you know, uh, is proportional to compensation. So the more that you contribute, the more that you get compensated. A topocratic system is one in which compensation depends on how an individual is connected in the network, if it's more connected or if it's connected in a more central position. And what we are able to show that under relatively general conditions, the transition between meritocracy and topocracy occurs when the average connectivity of the network is equal to the square root of the total number of nodes in the system. So let's use some numbers as an example. So let's take a population like the US with 300 million people. So according to this very simple model, which definitely you should take with a pinch of salt, what we would find is that, well, in this simple model, you would need to know, on average, 17,000 people for the system to be meritocratic. That's a lot of people. Nobody knows 17,000 people. And on average, certainly we don't know 17,000 other people. No, so in some sense, if we would take the model as a representation of reality, we would conclude that we would live in an actually a topocratic system, that it matters more who you know than what you're able to contribute. If we take the opposite uh, way of, of transforming this into numbers and, and we fix the number of links that you have, so we take Dunbar's number of 150, and we say that you have 150 contacts, what would be the maximum size of a network that would be meritocratic? 
you know, and it would be a network of only up to 22,000 people. Any network that would be larger than that you know, would actually become you know, topocratic. So in some sense, what this model starts to illustrate is that if you have a system in which the number of connections that a person has is limited and is bounded, and it's relatively small compared to the total number of nodes in the, in the system, then you know, under very simple conditions, you will find that those systems are going to be more topocratic than meritocratic. And assuming that market mechanisms are mechanisms that eventually distribute to people according to their ability to contribute, it's not necessarily the case. So the way that we summarize the main idea on, on, on that paper is we say that everybody receives according to their degree. So you know that Marx says to each according to its needs, you know, and here we say to each according to its degree. Because ultimately, how connected you are ends up determining in this simple mathematical model you know, how much you get. In, in this model, what are the connections that we're considering? And the connections that we're considering are those connections that allow the intermediary node to arbitrage content or the sale or purchase of content, of content between others. So, so it's not any random acquaintance connection, but it's a connection in which actually this intermediary has some sort of leverage. Uh, that's if you are an intermediary node as, a, you know, as an agent. As a rock star, the connections would be the number of people that you can actually sell your content directly to. So that would be the total number of people that you are connected and that you would have, in this case, like a channel to distribute you know, the, 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 the fruit of your work. So if you think about social media and, and, and whether people in social media is arbitraging content or producing content and whether they're intermediating or, 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 or producing things themselves, and I would find that there's a lot of people in this type of media that eventually are retransmitting or amplifying things that have been shared by others. So not necessarily, you know, there is a perfect association between how popular a person is in social media, you know, and how much content they're able to produce. But in many cases, you know, the association is that there are people that are very good at identifying, curating, and amplifying other people's content. So in some sense, in those cases, you could say that the person is, is performing a more intermediation role. Certainly there are exceptions and there's much more nuance in the real world. The example that I, you know, was describing is, is a very simple model that we're able to solve analytically with pencil and paper. And usually when you solve stuff with pencil and paper, it's relatively simple. But the results that come out have a way of teaching us about the world and helping us think about the fact that there might be a transition between meritocracy and topocracy that emerges when the networks that we inhabit become relatively large. One question is, well, now with the new media, is this going to help stimulate meritocracy or is it going to you know, uh, hinder, you know, the rise of meritocracy. And I think that it depends on which type of media we're communicating through. So the prediction of the model here is, is very simple and it's very straightforward. You have a group of people and those people become more connected, the system becomes more meritocratic. So among the networks of people that are distributed and that are self-organized, what the model is predicting is that those networks of people are going to become more meritocratic. Now, you know, at the same time, we have that happening nowadays in the web. And you have groups of people that are self-organizing, and there's new forms of leadership emerging, and there's new content emerging, and, and, and people just pick up on the content because, you know, it's good, not necessarily because it's being pushed to them by a marketing machinery. At the same time, you have other, you know, uh, media that, that has been marked by the rise of, like, these enormous hubs. So if you think about in the past, Music was distributed through a number of different stores. Nowadays, it's all through iTunes. And for the point of view of the seller and the buyer, their economy is based on, on the fact that there's one single hub that is the one that is mediating everything. You know? It's easier you know, to find the content that you want. You know? uh, there are less costs to the buyer, there are less costs to the seller. But at the same time, you know, that hub definitely gets a really big share because it's almost a monopoly in that network. So I think you have both of these things going on. In, in, on one end, you have an increase on, on inequality based on the fact that modern technology allows super hubs to emerge. You, know, you can have an basically infinite number of customers. You, you need only one Facebook in the world and you need only one iTunes in the world because you don't have the problem of, of distributing things physically anymore. And that's sort of like one new source of inequality that on the, on the short run is beneficial for the buyer and the seller 
you know, but eventually, you know, it, it, it has the systemic effect of, of making society unequal. On the other side, you have, you know, a more meritocratic system like the one that you would find on, on sites in which people are organizing themselves, you know, uh, in a more distributed, horizontal manner. And as those people become connected, those subgroups become more meritocratic. And you can think of places like Etsy, you know, which are places in which people share, you know, and, and sell different type of, you know, arts and craft type of content. So I think these two things are happening now in parallel. Some communities might be becoming more meritocratic as they become connected. Other ones, as they become dominated by hubs, they might have important economies, but at the same time, they're becoming more unequal.